Welcome to another installment in our five-part series of Department of Energy webinars that are focused on essential topics that are shaping the future of the built environment. Some of you may have already known that today is National Prosecco Day, but now that you all are aware, out of respect for our guests, please refrain from celebrating until after the webinar. Now, once we're done here, all bets are off, and I won't say a word to your boss. The building sector is currently responsible for 36% of the world's energy consumption and 39% of the world's carbon emissions. Most of the efforts to reduce these impacts have focused on the operational side through energy efficient building technologies. But we can't overlook the full life cycle of our buildings, which includes the energy and carbon associated with the materials, construction, maintenance, and demolition of buildings. This embodied energy and carbon is especially important due to the projected growth of the world's building stock and energy efficiency measures created at the expense of an increase in embodied impacts. So we're gonna delve more into this issue. We're gonna demonstrate the efforts made so far and discuss future considerations for reducing the overall life cycle impact of buildings. Now today we're having a guest debut. Heather Goach is currently an AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellow at the Department of Energy. She works within their Building Technologies Office. As a fellow, she has focused on expanding Building Technologies Office's work to consider life cycle impacts of buildings, both the embodied energy and the operational energy, when evaluating its projects and technologies. Earlier in her career, she was a project manager at the New York City Department of Environmental Protection, where she managed capital infrastructure improvement projects for the drinking water systems of New York City. She earned her PhD at the University of Michigan in environmental engineering, and she also holds a master's in environmental engineering and a bachelor in civil, in civil engineering from the University of Illinois, so she is a proud Big Ten alumni. We have a handful of sponsors for this webinar. I'm gonna start off with Train by Train Technologies, a global climate innovator. They create comfortable, energy efficient indoor environments for commercial and residential applications. Train solutions optimize indoor environments with a broad portfolio of energy efficient heating, ventilating, and air conditioning systems, building and contracting services, parts support, and advanced control. For more information, please visit www.train.com or www.traintechnologies. Com. Our next sponsor is Goodman Manufacturing. A member of Daikin Group, Goodman is the largest manufacturer of heating, ventilation, and air conditioning products for residential and commercial use. As the North American leader in HVAC, they are focused on design, engineering, and manufacturing of sustainable products that have helped millions of owners achieve reliable, high quality, and affordable indoor comfort. Providing additional support for today's webinar are DOE, Team Zero, and EBA. Now I also wanna let you know this webinar will be eligible for AIA credit and the certificates will be handled by SIPA, the Structural Insulated Panel Association. You should have seen that information that was posted on the registration page. It's also gonna be in the follow-up email from Green Builder Media, so I'm not gonna read all that information now, but just to help all those who are attending live, I am gonna put the information in the chat box so you all can see it there. Finally, I want to let you all know that you can submit questions for Heather. Simply use the questions box in the GoToWebinar control panel. I'll review those questions and ask them to her during the Q&A time that we've set aside after her presentation. Heather, I want to welcome you to the webinar series. All right, awesome. Thank you so much, Mike. And um, thank you for that introduction. And also thank you to the organizers of this series uh, for the opportunity to really talk about this important issue for the building sector. Um, as Mike mentioned, I am a, um, a AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellow um, at the Department of Energy, and I just want to put out the disclaimer that these views presented here um, represent my own and not necessarily the views of the, of the Department of Energy. Um, so to get started, uh, we know that the, the world's building stock constitutes a major source of energy consumption and emissions. Um, what you're looking at here is a snapshot of the 2017 breakdown of energy on the left and carbon emissions on the right by industry. What you can see is that the building sector is responsible for a significant piece of global energy use and uh, global carbon emissions. 
If we break this down further by the operation of both the commercial building sector in orange and the residential building sector in green, um, the energy and carbon emissions also associated with constructing those buildings in that year in blue. Most current research efforts focus on reducing these, you know, orange and green pieces of the pie responsible for operating buildings through energy efficiency efforts. Um, but we also have to think about this other, this other area of construction. And it might be especially important to consider the energy and emissions associated with construction because of the expected growth. Um, more than half of the global population is now concentrated in urban areas and by 2060, two thirds of the expected population of 10 billion people will live in cities. And so to accommodate this growth in population, we'll see major increases in the building stock. This figure is demonstrating um, just how much growth we expect to see in each of the coming decades. So at the end of 2030, we'll see an expected uh, increase of about 70 billion square meters of floor area. And in the subsequent decades, this growth in floor area continues to increase. Um, these different colors just really represent the growth attributing to that preceding decade. So um, between 2030 and 2040, you see an additional about um, 70 billion square meters and on. So in total, in uh, by 2060, we're expecting to see a doubling of the 2017 floor area. Um, this is about 230 billion square meters of new floor area to the global building stock um, to be added. One statistic that um, some of us might be familiar with, to put this in context, this is like adding an entire New York City every month for 40 years. So this is a significant thing that we need to be thinking about. Um, you know, how big is this problem? Um, can we figure out what the scope is going to be, the impact of, of construction here? Knowing how big it is, um, what are the most important areas to focus our efforts? How do our current efforts in en energy efficiency impact the embodied energy or emissions uh, calculation? And is there an opportunity to zoom out even further to consider how the building industry might capture more value in its materials and contribute to a circular economy, um, something that we um, are probably familiar with a, a buzzword in, in, um, in our circles right now. Um, and then finally, I'll talk through um, some questions that still exist and, and where efforts um, might be focused. So before we kind of dig into this, I, I do want to make sure we're all using the same terminology and or at least familiarize yourself with um, how I'm going to refer to embodied energy and, and um, operational energy. So what you're looking at here is a um, graphical representation, a simplification of the life cycle of a building and its components. Um, so I'll refer to embodied energy as the energy that's required to extract resources, uh, manufacture materials, transport those materials to um, the construction site, construction site, install them, uh, maintain and repair um, building technologies, and account for whatever happens when they're no longer use. Um, the energy that's required to operate the building, you know, is operational energy. We're considering that separate from the embodied energy calculation. Um, the associated carbon with these processes um, are also referred to as you know, the embodied carbon and operational carbon. And um, just so you know, I might be switching between embodied carbon and energy throughout this presentation, but generally speaking, um, energy and carbon values can be proportional. Okay, so starting with the scope, just how big um, or how important, significant will this issue be given this projected increase in the building stock? So to think about this, um, what we did was we, you know, looked at projected growth in floor area, um, as noted in that previous figure. And then each of those decades, um, assuming a rate of operational energy per floor area um, based on 2017. And then also looking at the um, rate of energy required to construct uh, additional floor area. 
and accumulating these um, over that decade. So between now and 2030, given the expected increase in construction of buildings, we expect a total of about uh, 50 gigatons of, of carbon emissions. Most of those emissions would come from construction, um, as you can see in embodied carbon in, in orange. Um, and again, I want to iterate, this is only considering new construction from 2017 and on. So if we look at each additional decade, as expected with an increase in construction over time, we see an increase in carbon emissions. Um, these you know, orange bars indicate the carbon associated with building in that decade, and then the blue indicate the carbon associated with operating the buildings within that decade. So over time, we see a cumulative increase um, of uh, you know 140 gigatons of carbon emissions, and I also want to point out that if you add you know this these totals and embodied and operational, um, you see that they're roughly you know they're the same order of magnitude. That the embodied carbon is very similar to operational carbon. So what I take away from this is that you know current efforts focus on you know the operational carbon, but um, embodied is is quite important as well. So we know that this is an important area to be thinking about, and you know because we have limited time and resources, you know the next natural thing is to consider where are the most important areas to focus on. And we need to be thinking about how complex the building sector is. Um, and how there are different needs across um, those different complexities. So we have different types of buildings, of course, residential and commercial buildings, each with different materials and energy needs. Um, there are buildings of you know, different vintages, meaning existing buildings, they have different needs than newly constructed buildings. We should also think about the type of materials and the amount of those materials that go into buildings. Um, so kind of digging in and thinking about the building envelope. Um, or lighting technologies or HVAC. Um, and all, there are other materials and buildings that may not require energy, um, but do require energy to be created, like furniture. And then of those materials that are prevalent and of the highest embodied energy, where in its life cycle is the majority of that embodied energy? Um, and that would help you kind of think about, well, those are the areas that we should think about in terms of research and development. So I'll next go through um, some examples of, of case studies and, and um, research in each of these kind of, of, of levels. So to have a broader sense of the average embodied energy associated between major building types, this figure is um, comparing data from a, a relatively small data set. I'll, I'll note um, of residential and commercial buildings in total, which is on the on the left hand side, and those same values but normalized to the total floor area for the U.S. on the right hand side. So there may be higher normalized values for commercial buildings, um, but both building types are significant users of embodied energy, um, assuming current construction projections. And these error bars overlap so much that we can't really make any um, significant conclusions beyond that. Next, we wanted to have a better understanding of what contributes to the embodied energy of a building. And this study compared three different types of residential building construction. So lightweight construction, um, concrete focused, uh, and a super insulated um, construction. And they estimated the embodied energy contributions of different materials. Um, and you can see that the materials that consist of generally the building envelope um, have the highest amount. And, and so it roughly is about half of the total embodied energy comes from the building envelope. And you see that trend across um, all of these different construction types, lending it to be an important area to, to focus on to consider improvements. Another example to investi investigate the contributions of embodied energy um, or, or emissions, this study focused on steel, which is more of a, a major material in commercial buildings. Um, the life cycle stages of steel are, are listed on the left-hand side, the 
transport and production. Um, and they estimated embodied carbon based on traveling different distances between production and the construction site. They also estimated emissions associated with the production of different types of steel that are used. The production of both um, rebar and structural steel contributes the majority of the embodied emissions compared to the distance uh, that it would need to travel, indicating the opportunity here is really to lower embodied emissions in the production of steel. So far, we see opportunities then in reducing uh, embodied emissions in the building envelope, um, focusing on production stage of, of the life cycle, at least for steel. Um, but to pivot back to what the industry is focused on uh, primarily in energy efficiency, we wanted a better understanding of how energy efficiency measures that reduce operational energy might impact embodied. So to answer this, or to investigate this, um, this study reviewed over um, 70 different case studies of life cycle energy assessments of residential buildings. And what they had done, they had compiled energy data from a range of different types of residential buildings um, and tried to categorize them as best they could into um, different um, energy efficiency, energy efficient buildings. Um, and so they wanted to look at um, what are the differences that reflect um, in the changes in operational and embodied energy contributions to the total life cycle energy. So here, um, conventional buildings are being referred to buildings that are built to the local building code. Um, low energy buildings uh, were defined as buildings constructed to energy efficiency guidelines that were better than the required um, local building code. And then net zero um, were buildings that were the most energy efficient, uh, built to guidelines that were better than the required building code and with some level of renewable energy that was generated on site. I will pay attention and note here that the data from these different case studies include a variety of assumptions, um, including the assumed lifespan of the building, what life stages are even included in the embodied energy estimation, what the functional unit was that they chose. Um, so there is a lot of variability here. But I will say that, I mean, what you can gather from this figure is that they demonstrate this shift in the major contributor um, to the total energy from operational to embodied energy. So for conventional buildings, you see the majority of the total energy impact is observed in the operations as we expect. Um, but as buildings become more energy efficient in operation, as demonstrated through low energy and net zero buildings, the embodied energy takes up a larger portion of the total energy impact while we do see an overall energy use decrease um, with energy efficiency improvements. So the bottom line here is that so far with energy efficiency improvements, the overall life cycle energy seems to decrease, but there is still an opportunity to innovate to reduce this um, embodied energy. So now I want to pivot from thinking about how these materials that contribute to embodied emissions and, and energy are manufactured to what happens to them at their end of life. Could there be a way to capture the value of waste products within the building sector? And you know, how could we um, use the circular economy framework and apply that to, to buildings? So traditionally, um, you know, we think of a building's life cycle and the life cycle of its materials as pretty linear, um, often ending in those materials um, being landfilled. And in fact, if we um, take a bit deeper look into the waste that's generated in the U.S., construction and demolition waste consist of um, more than twice the amount of municipal solid waste in 2017. And, and of that construction and demolition waste, about 90% of it is from demolition. Now, this data has not been resolved for the building sector specifically. Um, this is certainly a gap in the data, 
because um, this information includes waste from infrastructure projects, including buildings, roads, and, and bridges. Um, but it does give us a sense of the scale and general trend of a waste generation in the U.S. However, the, U the U.S. EPA did put together some estimates for the building sector. Um, the EPA estimated building-related construction and demolition materials that are wasted using national statistical data and typical waste generation data from um, construction, which is pointed out in blue here, um, and renovation in orange, and demolition in green. They're also able to distinguish between the residential sectors um, in those solid colors on the right-hand side of the pie graph and commercial building sector um, in, the, in this like, pattern um, color uh, on, on the left-hand side. So it's worth noting um, the larger contributors here. Um, so you see demolition of commercial buildings and renovating residential buildings as the um, higher contributor to, to waste generation. Also in their analysis, they note that about half of the building related construction and demolition materials are discarded. Um, much of this material goes to um, specifically designated construction and demolition landfills. Um, but these types of landfills are, are regulated by state and local government. So the EPA didn't have um, more specific information on disposal data for, for those landfills. Um, you know, CND materials can also be disposed of in, in MSW landfills as well. So it's clear that, you know, there's a significant portion of the building materials that end in landfills. And in fact, globally, building demolition is responsible for 25% of all materials sent to the landfill. When I heard this statistic, I was, um, it really shocked me, and I feel like it's even worth repeating. Demolition of buildings. Um, is responsible for a quarter of all materials that are sent to the landfill worldwide. Um, you know, and this linear approach results in construction materials and buildings with significant embodied energy and emissions. Um, you know, and to reiterate, current design and building methods largely ignore the opportunity to capture the value and utility of these some of these materials at their end of use. So, by taking a circular economy approach, there might be opportunities to reduce the total energy and total emissions over the life cycle of a building, could help account for the embodied impacts of materials that go into buildings, and identify approaches that capture the value of materials, um, that capture the value of the energy and emissions associated with end of life. I think, too, that these circular economy approaches can be complementary to operational energy efficiency improvements that have been the recent focus um, in energy reduction, both for, for new builds and retrofits. So I do want to take a second to explain what we mean by circular economy. I think this phrase has um, a lot of different definitions. Um, and one definition of this term is that it's um, a circular economy is an economic system that's aimed at eliminating waste um, and having a continual use of resources. And this approach is really used to capture value of materials, optimize resource use through these different pathways. And you can see these pathways in this, um, in this figure here in the circles and reuse, uh, remanufacturing, recycling, and collectively we can refer to these as REX processes. The larger these circles get, the more energy is required to make a product or a material uh, useful. And understanding what the trade-offs are between these different processes is important to understand which pathway might be the most um, appropriate or efficient. So the strategies that are smaller, like higher, you know, these inner circles retain value for longer and typically have lower energy requirements. Um, whereas as you move down the circles towards the bottom disposal, that has the lowest or no value, um, you know, energy that's required to get back to an equivalent functional product is the highest. Um, you have to start over with extracting materials um, with processing them and, and manufacturing them. So by taking a circular economy approach, there might be 
um, opportunities to identify approaches that capture value here. So how can we apply this to the building sector? How can we be intentional about the materials that are used in buildings to ensure that you know, these re-ex processes um, are able to be used at their end of life? Um, how can we design buildings in a way to enable these re-ex processes? I think it's worth noting that um, you know, some energy efficiency building approaches uh, already leverage some of these processes, like extending the lifetime, um, reusing the shell while upgrading different components. And they can provide insights into what might be preferable. Um, but we do need a better understanding of the energy and material impacts. Um, and it requires a full accounting of the waste streams to help identify opportunities that further drive down energy use while avoiding unintended consequences such as higher energy or emissions impacts. So to first understand the opportunities in this area, um, first requires a better understanding of the material flows, you know, just how much waste and what kind of waste is generated and what the impacts of those materials are before determining which interventions might best reduce total energy and emissions while still maintaining value. So to begin to tackle this question, um, myself and some other colleagues at the Department of Energy uh, put together a, an ACEEE summer study paper um, to begin to map out some of these material flows. In this study, we used um, available data to map out the material use and the waste streams of construction. Um, I'll note that this was for combined construction activity. So again, this data would include waste streams from buildings, but also from other infrastructure like roads and bridges. And we used, um, we aggregated available data to get a snapshot of the material flows um, and used the EPA waste reduction model to estimate the associated energy and emissions to those material flows. And so I'll show some of these results in the form of, of sinky flow diagrams. So this first um, diagram maps out the construction material flow um, from left to right. On the left are materials that go into stock construction. Um, and you see this stock is in, is in this pink color here. Um, there are materials that remain in the infrastructure stock, you know, as shown in the uh, pink bar all the way on, on the right hand side. But there are materials that don't stay in the stock. Um, we see about, um, yeah, about 530 um, million megatons of material are wasted. So let's zoom into this um, area here to have a better understanding of, what, of what's going on. You know, what's great about these safety diagrams is that you can actually follow the, um, the lines back to determine um, where, where these, where it came from. So um, the materials that didn't end up in stock, we see about 17% um, of it by weight, it goes to the landfill. The rest of it is um, used for another purpose, some sort of uh, second use. Um, the thing, one of the things to note here is that the data doesn't show us what kind of quality of materials. So it's important to think about, um, you know, materials that were, um, that they could be uh, recycled or downcycled. And so um, we want to make sure that we're maintaining good quality products. And if there is an ability to either upcycle or maintain the same level of quality, uh, we should utilize that. Of the items that went into landfill, like I was saying earlier, you can kind of follow these lines back to determine what ended up going to the landfill. And so um, thinking how we could reuse some of these materials as well, um, what are the separation processes that are necessary to, to make these products um, useful for, for a second use, um, and hoping to maintain some level of, of recycling or, or upcycling. And so I think overall, in order to um, increase circularity, we want to avoid landfilling materials that could be reused and maximize that value um, and productivity. 
So I mentioned that we also um, applied that the EPA waste reduction model to um, determine what it, are the energy um, impacts associated with the material flows. So there are a few things that stand out here. And so, yeah, sorry, this is the energy flow sinking diagram. Um, and what we can see here, the concrete, um, the darker blue bar on the left-hand side, stands out for a smaller energy footprint relative to its material flow. Um, similarly, the energy requirements for steel and iron in the green bars um, are larger relative to the material flow. And these comparisons highlight um, which materials offer larger energy savings and where research efforts such as lower energy process alternatives for steel or iron could have a larger impact. Um, unlike the material flow though, if you look at the landfilling um, bar on the right hand side um, is quite small. Um, the landfilling energy factor we found out accounts for process energy and transportation, um, but not embodied energy. So again, more information would be um, helpful to better account for embodied energy across all of the stages of these materials. Okay, so one last confusing Sankey diagram. Um, we're gonna look at the carbon associated with the, the material flows. And many of the trends are similar to the energy results above. Um, the main differences relate to non-energy derived emissions such as um, process emissions from concrete uh, in blue um, and changes in forest carbon storage, specifically from um, wood and cardboard shown in, in orange and, and pink. So in the case of concrete, the emissions impact is larger than the energy since nearly half of the greenhouse gas emissions result from the chemical process and are not due to energy consumption itself. Similarly, for um, the impact of wood and, and cardboard, cardboard um, they demonstrate a larger impact relative to the material flow. And most of the emissions result from the changes in forest carbon storage. So if these products come from sustainably managed forests where harvesting of timber would enable regrowth, some of these emissions could be mitigated. So just a few other conclusions to take away from this analysis. Um, it really notes the importance of distinguishing energy impacts from emissions. Um, there could be potential to increase material efficiency by reusing concrete. Um, there could be greater heat and energy recovery from gases and waste streams during steel and iron production. It can also be noted that there are some current challenges that need to be addressed. Um, we know steel is and can be recycled. So improving separation processes for different steel products could help increase this amount. Um, again, on that separation uh, note, figuring out how to separate out chemical additives or remove them would make concrete reuse or recycling um, a bit more easy, it would make it easier. Um, and finally, I think this uh, analysis bolsters an overall theme of better data on material flow. I'll reiterate that this was done on the construction of infrastructure. So it included, this data included roads, bridges, in addition to buildings. So having more granular data for the building sector would improve the analysis to determine opportunities specific to the building sector. This analysis also um, highlights the importance for better tools for calculating life cycle energy and emissions uh, for other alternatives. Um, and finally, you know, it's important that the technical and economic potential be considered in this analysis to fully reduce uh, life cycle energy and emissions in buildings. So we can also um, explore what opportunities there are to build in REACTS processes to the design of buildings and their components. And so this could include you know, preemptively designing out possible features and materials um, that could become waste or devalued um, during the life cycle of a given product. It can also include design for disassembly and reuse in the building sector or potentially in other sectors. So I'll go through a few examples of this in practice and um, go over some gaps that remain for this concept to be fully realized. 
Um, one notable example of, of this um, is the design and uh, construction of the ICE house or the innovation for the circular economy house. Um, these pictures show the ICE house in a close up version of the wonder frame um, that's installed in, in Davos, Switzerland, where it was showcased and used as a meeting space for the World Economic Forum uh, annual meeting. And what's really novel here is that the, the structure and the same components have been assembled, disassembled uh, five times since its first assembly in 2016. Um, this structure is primarily made out of four materials, um, the aluminum, uh, which you can see in the structural frame, um, a polymer, an aerogel, and nylon. Um, and, you know, these materials are assembled in ways that allow them to be disassembled and, and reused. There are some limitations, though, of course, um, you know, exposed aluminum elements and translucent wall materials may not always be desired. Um, this is a closed and technology dependent system, and so it can be quite limited in, in how it's deployed. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier, too, about the importance of separation processes, and so if, if they're if you're not able to separate um, the aerogel from the, the sheeting, um, that plastic will likely end up in the landfill. Um, so it's another important thing to be to be considering. Um, for another example, um, this team from New Zealand uh, wanted to focus on changes to the building's um, structure itself and create a circular building envelope system. So they wanted to address the current way of building in New Zealand, which is very similar here, you know, um, stick frame where you um, adhere uh, vapor permeable material wrapped around the structure and, it, and it's adhered in ways that make it difficult to reuse. And so this new structural frame could allow material reuse by changing the way the outer building envelope layers are adhered to the structure. The frame that they propose um, is shown here in this uh, in these pictures, and it's designed to be held together by, um, which is this is really cool, fully reversible and repeatable uh, mechanical joints. Um, this is also from a group that you know has performed a lot of testing on it to make sure that it is laterally stable, um, resistant to earthquake and wind loads, without the need for additional bracing. Um, they did highlight a main barrier for circularity that the materials that are durable enough to be weather resistant um, are often too expensive to be mainstream in circular construction. Um, so this is another area that, that needs to be thought about. Another thing that this, um, the authors of this work did, um, they did a lot of thinking about potential guidelines for, for circularity. Um, and I did want to point out some of the guidelines that could be used to help inform and quantify circularity for the building industry. Um, they divided these characteristics into things that you know, were a must have, um, things that were qualitative, um, and other um, characteristics that were more measurable. And to note, I, I just want to point out a few, um, you know, no toxic or hazardous materials, no secondary finishes um, to enable separation at the end of use. Um, and they must use mechanical connections to, again, enable the second use. They also encourage the use of, of um, modular design, um, the use of common tools and equipment, um, and that the joints and components be uh, able to withstand repeated use. Um, materials should also be prefabricated and standardized, and the number of materials they, again, you know, um, notes should be minimized along with the number of materials that no longer have value at the end of use. Another way to think about circularity um, is to better account for the materials that are in buildings and how they might be used later. So building information modeling and other digital building mapping technology can help turn buildings into uh, banks of materials. Um, owners would have information on what materials and components um, are in the building, where they're sourced from, and, and guidance on how they could be used in the future. This can make uh, reusing building components and recycling materials much easier, 
One example of this um, is the circular building here shown in this picture. Um, this is a prototype that was part of the London Design Festival and was developed by Arup and the Built Environment Trust. And while it is an example of disassembly and reusability, it also employed um, digital technology to tag all items. Each material had a unique QR code that contained information allowing it to be reused. Um, this organization, uh, BAMB, uh, Buildings as Material Banks, uh, is also making it its mission to enable the shift circularity through the use of electronic material passports. Um, these passports would include information on uh, material characteristics that give value for recovery and reuse. By having this information in one place, uh, the passports would aim to increase the value or keep the value of material products and components over time. It would help create incentives for suppliers to produce circular materials. Uh, it could also make it easier for developers and renovators to choose circular building materials and to facilitate the take back of products. Um, currently, I believe they have about 300 material passports for different products with them um, with corresponding software. So um, I want to end with just thinking about uh, what are the challenges that remain? Um, you know, these studies have provided a good indication of of the movement and interest in this area, but um, there's still a lot of work yet to be done before the building industry can really reduce its impact um, through a circular economy. The, the material flow analysis um, really highlights the need for building sector specific data to help determine um, building industry specific opportunities. Um, you know, there should be a, really some thought around an agreement of what we mean by circularity and how we measure it. Um, the performance and durability of materials should never be compromised for REX processes or REX materials. We also need to think about the infrastructure that's also required to, um, to receive these recovered materials and the capacity to properly process them um, into, in, into useful materials. Um, and because there's you know, a lack of transparency in the supply chain of materials, it can be hard to know what materials a building contains and which of these materials can be reused, remanufactured, et cetera. Um, material passports can help with this, but um, this practice may need to be expanded and needs to be accessible. And finally, there are um, many stakeholders in the built environment, which, which makes circularity difficult. Uh, there's rarely a, cont a continuity of ownership and control of buildings and materials. Those in early stage development um, may not be held accountable for outcomes further down the chain, like in the operation of the building and its end of life. Um, so a collaborative approach is really necessary here. Um, and there are likely many other, there are many other challenges, um, but I, I think this is a really interesting area um, to, to continue thinking about and researching. So with that, um, I will end this part of the presentation, this webinar, and I'm really excited to hear your questions. Thanks for, for your attention. All right, thank you, Heather. And uh, as she said, go ahead and send in your questions via the questions box. Uh, we do have a couple to get to right away. Um, with, uh, if it's possible, Heather, we got a couple of questions about slide number 12. Um, so if you're able to, to roll back to slide number 12, I'll go ahead and pose those questions. Um, <clears throat> the first one, I'll, I'll ask them both at the same time. The first one comes from Roy. Um, he wanted to know if the graphs projected out um, based on existing technologies and energy use, or does it factor in any effects of increasing decarbonation or other energy efficiency techniques such as renewables? Yeah. This is this is a good point, and I should have mentioned this. Thank you for bringing that up, Roy. Um, uh, this is assuming uh, what we have right now. Um, this is assuming a rate of operational um, uh, the, the the yeah the it's not including any potential um, future decarbonization. So this could look a lot better. <laughs> um, this is more of a kind of 
I don't know if I want to say worst case because it could probably look worse too, but um, this is based on um, our current current practices. Okay. Um, we also had a question from Christopher on this same slide. He said, uh, what are the assumptions used for determining operational energy? Are those new buildings uh, being added to the housing stock every decade getting more efficient over time? Yeah, so um, I think related to the last question, um, so again, this is only for new construction after 2017. This doesn't account for the existing building stock. Um, I just wanna reiterate that. And then, yes, it does, um, the, the calculation really was, it, it is a crude calculation. Um, it really was just focused on a rate that is seen in 2017, how uh, much carbon, um, what are the carbon emissions associated per year for operating um, buildings in that year. And so we applied that to each year and, and summed that um, through, through the decade. Okay. Um, I had a question for you and it was in regards to the uh, building stock growth projections. Um, a couple different questions really on that. First is, um, do the building stock growth projections align with the global population growth projections? Because I've, I've seen some data that seems to indicate that global population growth is going to kind of flatten late in the century. And maybe that's farther out than what you've got for your building stock uh, growth projections. But I just didn't know if if those two data sets are aligning at all, or if it's kind of operating independent of one another. Yeah, no, that that's a really good point. Um, this, yeah, these projections are really based on, um, I, I think, a, a continual, it, it was a, a 10 billion uh, population um, by 2060. So I, I don't think it included that um, updated version where things, might flatten out. Um, yeah. Okay. And obviously, um, the data has um, has references there um, that uh, talk about 2018. So they're mm -hmm. not going to take into account the pandemic that we're currently living right. through. Um, yeah. <clears throat> but the um, I just I'm, I guess I'm wondering what how do you think the projections will be affected? Um, if we see a large shift um, to work from home amongst a decent percentage of uh, of the workforce, yeah, this is an this is an interesting question. Um, I think you know this does include um, it includes both residential and commercial buildings. Um, I think like this. The point of um, these slides 10 through 12, I, I believe, um, focus on construction of new buildings. Um, it is, it's a good question um, to think about, will we need more commercial buildings, et cetera? But I, I think a lot of the growth is seen in the residential sector. So um, yeah, I think we'll need to update our, <laughs> um our projections i i don't have a good answer for you um yeah i'm not i'm not sure <laughs> okay well, that's fine that's fine um we had a question uh from joan um if you could please discuss circularity of solar collectors are they being reused or repurposed mm. That that's a good good question. Um, so I do I I will honestly say I am more focused on I'm in the building technologies office and uh, when we were working um, on in the office we were just down the hall from the solar um, technology office and I will kind of punt this to to find out from from them. Um, I do know that there is interest in in this effort of um, circular of thinking, how, do, how can we reuse solar panels? How can we use the different pieces of, of um, the different materials within um, solar collectors? And I think they face a lot of similar issues with 
regard to material separations as well. Um, I will confidently say that it is something being investigated and, um, and researched right now, but I um, will have to defer to them <laughs> to know more about the actual status of it. Okay. Um, wanted to hit on the topic of recycling for a moment. Um, so Perry had a very, a very well thought out. It's a little bit of a complex question, so give me a second here to get through it. But um, Perry asked, is there a large enough market for recycling building materials to reduce the amount in landfills significantly? Uh, are there enough facilities to process the amount of waste? And then you've got the transportation and the material segregation costs, is this really cost effective? Mm -hmm. um, that is an excellent, excellent point. I think, um, I think some, I, if, that, if that study hasn't been done already, um, needs to be done, because it, it, you're right that it is something that we need to, um, you know, cost is one aspect of this, right? But I, I think um, that, with circularity, I mean, I, that was one of the points that I tried to make at the end where we need to think about what are the impacts that we are um, thinking about or considering or care about. And cost is certainly one. Um, carbon and, you know, where the, the whole life cycle of, like, where are you drawing the boundary of, of that material, of its, if it's the building, if it's the building sector. Um, I think that it's a multi-objective function here and um it i don't have i don't have the numbers um uh, for for this particular question but it is an important one and i i agree that this is another thing that needs to be um pretty front and center for um you know to make that incentive um if if that is something that needs to be pursued that that incentive is is part of making circularity mainstream. And the second part of Perry's question, I think, can help this this point a little bit, maybe, because um, it might be able to help the circularity. Um, uh, the question is, um, as an example, engineered quartz countertops are recyclable, but where do you find out where and mm. how? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with you um, that that because I, I think there was another um, well, I meant to make the point, um, but I agree that having the communication, the economic structures in place for this isn't trivial and needs to be um, prevalent alongside the actual you know scientific research questions as well. So how how do we make those markets available um needs to also be part of this yeah so good good points um let's pivot to uh codes for a second um herb wanted to know are there any building codes such as the igcc um that mandate or even allow for embedded energy to be covered um to be covered i um or maybe to be addressed or to be required or you know like is there something in there that some measure that talks about you know you have to reduce embedded energy or uh, right you know, anything so, that is it, or, or are these codes silent on and on embedded energy yeah i so i do know of more um uh, like municipalities or governments that are um more on the state level that are making commitments to this and, and certainly um internationally or in Europe, especially, um, there are a lot of examples that we can point to. Um, I, I am not aware of any codes specifically um, in the US that, that point to this, but um, you know, that, that could be a, a direction this takes in the future. Um, I do know that I'll just kind of circle back to like the, initiatives for in California, New York, and, and others um, that do have goals associated with reducing um, their embodied carbon, embodied energy um, for their building sectors, um, for their infrastructure. 
Okay. Um, let's now pivot to um, just kind of the topic of rethinking, rethinking things, and and how how might we better position some some things in the future. So I'll start off first with a question from Eric. Um, he, he apologizes that he may have missed this part of the presentation, but what are some of the construction cost implications of the circular uh, construction technologies you discuss? Like if, as an example, what he brings up is, uh, it seems that sealants and adhesives are gonna need to be almost completely eliminated, which would mean that many standard joint details will need to be completely rethought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, this is, I, I didn't cover that, but um, yeah, and th this is a really good, good question. Um, and another area where, I, it's just another example of how complex this topic is and, and how it, um, it touches on all of these other aspects. And so I think this is an important, I, I don't have the answer to that, um, but I, this, um, yeah, would be another interesting and important thing to be thinking about. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer. It's okay, it's okay. Wanted to put up the final call for questions. Uh, please send them in via the questions box. Uh, I, I had one more for you. And uh, again, it kind of goes to that reimagining or rethinking things. If large corporations start to downsize, uh, their retail or that their retail, their commercial space as their employees choose to work from home. What opportunities are there to redesign or repurpose large commercial spaces that we might start to see become vacant or at least, mm -hmm. you know, the usage gets cut in half? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I, I think this is, a, is an interesting question. Um, like commercial office space or um or even retail um that we yeah um i mean i think it really is it is an opportunity to just kind of think about what are other uses um what and if i i don't know i just think of an example of um there's a big box uh store um in your neighborhood and it's changed into a different one like there's a new one that's being built just like i i have an example of this where i grew up and um the other one is sitting vacant so i i feel like those are the kinds of things that we need to um in my personal opinion avoid um but i and rethink about how what are other potential uses for that space um and and turning that into maybe more communal areas for um, municipalities to, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think, yeah, it's a it's an important thing to be thinking about and um, being creative with with this uh, with that opportunity. Well, I think to some degree it wouldn't really be a, a whole new train of thought, right? Because. Mm -hmm. um, we're seeing that you know for the large for the most part i guess large malls are kind of dying mm -hmm. um we saw this i think during the great recession if not right after september 11 where people you know uh weren't buying cars and some car dealerships were going under and so it was like oh we got this huge acreage of space that that now isn't being used and occupied anymore and so i feel like in a way it's just kind of re channeling our energies from instead of malls or or car dealerships, it might now be a uh, large office space. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Eric Eric uh, brings up a good follow-up point uh, along those same lines. He, he wanted to know if uh, it makes sense to look at this from a different angle. Um, instead of attempting to disassemble and then rebuild buildings, what if we just change the building planning and zoning codes mm. <laughs> to allow retrofits of some of these building types, whether it's parking garages or indoor malls or large commercial spaces, so that you don't need to demolish them. Um, you don't need to put them into the waste stream. You just change the, the codes and then they can be yeah. repurposed that way. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. And another you know, reason why we have to be thinking much broader than just this one, like the building sector only, like, or, or 
engineers or manufacturers only. Like it needs to be a full, um, all lots of stakeholders here um, to to help think about this this challenge. Yeah. Is that something that the DOE can be a part of? I know you're speaking on behalf of yourself and not the DOE, but just in your personal opinion, is this is this within the scope of what DOE um, is tasked with doing? I th I absolutely think so. I I think um, DOE has a lot of um, stakeholders they you know in, do engage with and. If you know one of the purposes there, I think, is being just a platform to to bring lots of voices to the table, and so, um, and if, you know, but making sure that all voices are there is is an important aspect of that, and so, um, uh, yeah. In short, I think yes. Um, but if if there's another entity that m makes more sense, then, or maybe it's a you know it's a convening of other agencies as well but doe is also there um, I, th I think that approach also works too okay well i don't see any other questions so i want to say thank you heather for joining us today for the first time for sharing your uh, your knowledge with us I, I really do appreciate it thank you thank you very much thank you also to our audience for attending and asking great questions and thank you once again to Train, to Goodman, to DOE, Team Zero, and EBA for their generous sponsorship of this webinar. Now we've had a little bit of a scheduled change. Our five-part series of DOE webinars continues in two weeks. So on Thursday, August 27th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, we're going to talk with a familiar guest, Jim Myers of Sweep. He'll talk to us once again about the latest energy code and its march towards net zero. To recap, we will be back in two weeks. In the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy, and take care.